Nein. <lacht> Ready to start? I cannot hear anyone. Can anyone hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. Yes, I can see your slides too. Okay, good. Let me know when to start. Well, maybe the moderators haven't come back from coffee. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, yeah, Moshe, please start. Okay, hello everyone. Good to be with you in virtually. And as we hear every day now about machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, and I'd like to look at machine learning and logic and combine it with uh, another way of thinking about uh, human intelligence. And this has been known as fast and slow thinking. So every day now we hear about uh, big data and machine learning and data science. And some people says we are maybe at a peak hype or even beyond the peak hype. And there is a common perception that we are going now through a, a Kuhnian paradigm shift. Uh, Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn wrote a, a famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, and he introduced the phrase paradigm shift. And the, Typical perception is that there is an old theory, we just throw it out, and there is a new theory. Uh, for example, the, the Ptolemaic theory of the planet versus the Copernican theory of the planets. So the, this perception is you throw the old theory, you have a whole new theory, total revolution. But in reality, it's a bit more complicated than that, and very often uh, new theories refine the old ones. So, I mean, we have general re relativity introduced in the beginning of the 20th century. Did we throw out Newtonian mechanics? Absolutely not. We went to the moon using Newtonian mechanics. We've been building using Newtonian mechanics. So data science, I think my argument, data science refined formal science. Formal science is about science with, with models. You know, much of my research is about uh, formal models. And I argue that data science refined formal science. Now, Daniel Kahneman wrote, published a book about a decade ago called Thinking Fast and Slow. And the argument that human intelligence has these two facets, fast thinking and slow thinking. What is fast thinking? You have an auto autonomous vehicle. It has to recognize, is this a stop sign? That takes, you need to do this in, in, a, in a second, in a fraction of a second. Identifying a snake in the grass should take you a fraction of a second. You're not going to go and make observations. It takes you a fraction of a second. What do you do about a stop sign? It's the rule that stops and require you to stop. This is this is logic. This is slow thinking. Uh, Anon Shashua, who is the CEO of Mobileye, it's a company that now subsidiary of Intel and uh, promoting technology for autonomous vehicle. And Amnon Shashio wrote a paper about five years ago explaining why you cannot develop autonomous vehicles just by, by driving around and collecting data. He, he argued that, that uh, it's a societal, social argument why autonomous vehicles need to be a factor of a thousand times safer than, than regular, than human-driven vehicle. And that means that we'll have to drive one billion miles to collect the data. So it's not feasible. So he said you have to... You can drive, we can drive millions of miles to collect data, but you have to combine it with reasoning. And I think this tells us if we want to combine fast and slow thinking, we have to learn how to combine logic, which I think of it as slow thinking, with machine learning, which is fast thinking. And that to me is one of the grand challenges today, how to combine logic and machine learning. And in a more specific context, I want to look at uh, 
what's known as autom automated decision systems, ADS. In 2018, Jim Larbus and Chris Hankin wrote an, a column in, in a communication of the ACM about, about ADS, and they wrote that the question is, how do we regulate the system? And they argued that we should regulate them. They wrote the widespread adoption of AD system will be economically disruptive and will raise new complex societal challenges. Disdain for regulation is pervasive through, throughout the tech industry. In the case of automated decision making, this attitude against regulation is mistaken. So how should we regulate automated decision system? That's a subject that we can discuss at length, but people now expect that this system are going to be fair, you know, lack of bias, they should be accountable, they should be transparent, and they should be explainable. So this has become now a common phrase in, in, in AI, to have explainable AI. So what is explainable AI? We want the results to be understood by humans. And if we want to have human-centered AI, one of the requirements is that AI decision by automation system must be explainable. But how do you give explanation? You know, we're talking, for example, neural net, deep neural nets. How do you give explanation? You can't say, well, this neuron fire because that neuron fire because that neuron fire. You want to talk to people in their language, and that is, again, logic. And I, get, I go back to this grand challenge, combine logic with machine learning, which now some many people call neurosymbolic reasoning, and that's a very hot topic. I will talk about my approach to, to towards this integration, and this to make logic quantitative. And I'm going now to delve and become more technical, because partly I want to, to send a message here that... Uh, the digital humanism is not just some, some some fuzzy, good feeling type of research. There are actually technical, hard technical questions that we must address in order to fulfill the, the desire for digital humanism. So now I'm going to do a deep dive into, into more technical details. So Boolean satisfiability is a classical computer science problem. You have a Boolean expression using and, or, and not and the variable gets value 0 or 1, and you want to know, can you assign uh, values 0 and 1 to satisfy the formula, to make it true? So this is an example of a formula. It's a conjunction of these junctions, and you can, there are four variables, so there are 2 to the 4, 16 possible assignments, so you can very quickly check to see this formula satisfiable. And development of the last 25 years made Boolean logic some kind of an assembly language for reasoning. So there are now growing lots of applications about how can we use Boolean reasoning to solve all kinds of problems. Now, there is a long history here, which is, in fact, goes back even to the 19th century, kick in with, can we solve, how do we solve this problem mechanically? And as soon as people built computers in the, in the 1940s, within a decade, People start building computers to do the program, what program to do um, Boolean reasoning. The first was by Newell, Shaw, and Simon, already in 1955, nine years after the ENIAC was turned on. And then there was a sequence of paper by Davis and Putnam, another Davis and Putnam, Davis Putnam and, and Davis Logman and Loveland, and that led to the to the DPLL technique for Boolean satisfiability, which is you convert to CNF. You run a backtracking search, and you have one one heuristical unit clause preference. Now, it is an exponential time procedure, but we don't think we can do much better because Boolean satisfiability was shown by Cook and Levine to be NP-complete. When I was a PhD student, you know, you had solver that could solve problems with hundreds of variables. And if you told them that's not big enough, they would say, well, what do you want? It's NP-complete. But sometimes in the mid-90s, we had so-called the SAT revolution, and a combination of heuristic uh, was developed that, that had a huge, huge uh, impact on the performance of these tools. It's now called CDCL, Conflict-Driven Closed Learning. I think that this name is a, is a huge mistake. We should call it deep solving. It would have been much popular then. What are heuristic? Like, instead of doing backtracking, you do back jumping. You jump not one level at a time, but you can jump back. When you, read, when you backtrack, you back jump. And smart unit close preference, conflict-driven close learning, 
smart choice heuristic, restart, a whole bunch. I won't. I can speak for a long time just on that. Um, big important tool will develop, grasp in the mid 90s, and a few years later, five years later, shaf. And today we are solving problem with millions of variables and clauses. Really, just dramatic progress. And a decade ago, Sanjit Cheshia at uh, Berkeley wanted to understand how much progress has been made. So he took at the time about 12 years of such solvers and benchmarked them on the same problem on the same machine. These were solvers that published over a decade. He said, let's compare them to each other. And he showed that the problem that was took 800 seconds in 2000 was solved by in, by in one second by, by 2012. So you had improvement of three orders of magnitude within about a decade. And this progress has been continuing so much that people are now talking about Moore's law for such solvers. Okay? And, and nobody fully understand why are we still continue to make such dramatic progress. And it turns out that once you have such a solver that can solve such a large problem, you find real applications. So uh, again, this is a decade ago, a paper was published by Leonardo de Moura and Nicola Bjorner at CS, in CSCM about how Microsoft is using their such solver Z3 to, for, for application in software engineering. These are all real up in software development. These are not academic applications. These are all industrial applications. So as we speak now, there are hundreds of machines crunching, working on such problem, helping helping Microsoft develop software. And there are also huge application in in formal verification in the in the semiconductor industry. So such vault solver really are today in dust, not just academic reality, industrial reality. Now remember, my goal is to try to take logic and make it quantitative. Why do we need, want to make logic quantitative? Because it's important, the world has nuances. It's not just about true and false. It's about degree of truth, degree and false. If a, if a neural net is making diagnosis, we know that it's not 100% correct, okay? And we want to, to do what's called uncertainty quantification. We want to know how, you know, if you make a diagnosis and say this is, this is cancer, how confident is the system of this diagnosis? What is the probability of error? And all this required that we go to quantitative reasoning. It turned out even in the in the industry, in in the in the hardware and software industry, there is application for quantitative reasoning. <coughs> and this has to be in the context of verification of hardware and software system, which is you the industry approaching trillion dollar a year. Now, how do you when you this? We all know that when you write a program. It's really hard to get it to do just what you intended to do it. You have something in mind, you build a program and you discover, no, it has a bug. The bug first, so maybe it's just a syntactical bug, but there are then there can be very subtle semantical bug. And then you, 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 you know, think this is a product, you ship it to market. How do you know that it's going to do the right thing? So I spent my career working on so-called formal verification, which is to construct a mathematical model and using logic to reason about the system. When you go to the industry and you say, okay, do you use formal verification? Many companies say, yes, we do. But when you ask them to quantify how much do they use it, for example, how many you know, out of all the verification engineer, how many do formal verification? My estimate, it's less than 10% of the effort. Okay, this is, it's a bit hard to get very rigorous data, but when I go and I talk to people from the industry and I said, okay, how many people, how many verification engineers do you have? How many, how many of them do formal? I get answer that maybe around 10%. So what, how do people really do formal verification? They do it using old fashioned technique called testing. You simulate the system under different testing scenario and you check the result towards the ideal result. And this is at least 90% of the effort. But so this is now the, the, the dominant approach. You have a design, you, you simulate it with respect to test vectors, the test vector, that's what they are called, input test vector, they represent different scenarios. You know what the result should be and you compare them. The problem is the test space is can be astronomically large. How much should you test? And the answer is very often if you have no principle, you test until the, 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 the level of 
you, you find fewer and fewer bugs, at some point it's become a management decision. Okay, we are done. So take, for example, the, the, the one of the most famous uh, bugs ever, which was the floating point division bug of the Pentium when the Pentium came out, mid-90s. So imagine that we are trying to, to verify floating point division for 128-bit numbers. Well, if we try to do exhaustive testing, then there are 2 to the 56 possibilities. And if we, if we start now when we do it with a, one test per one Planck time constant, the sun will go nova before we are done. So this is just not scalable. So how should we do it? So the classical approach is that you take people, verification engineer, and they read the specification and they write test cases and they try to capture all kind of important scenarios. What is important, it depends on the on the specification, depends on past experience. It, you know, it's an art, not a science. And turn out that a verification engineer can write about 20 per day. It's like writing code. So you have, a, a, let's suppose you have 100 verification engineers, they write 2,000 cases per day. You give it to, to simulator. The simulator will be done in, in, in a few minutes. So which just but just people writing test cases manually, we can never have really deep coverage of the test space. So a method that emerged in mid-90s at IBM in IBM Haifa is called random constraint. And the idea is that the verification engineer does not write a test case test vectors. Rather, it write constraints that describe problematic areas. And then we use constraint solver to solve the constraints and use the solution as test vectors. And now by generating many such solutions, we can generate many, many more test cases and we can obtain a much higher coverage of the test space. And today, this is the standard methodology, okay? We don't, people don't talk about it much in academia, but this is much of, much of a new, your laptop was tested a little bit using formal method, I said maybe 10%, but the other the other 90% was using random constraint constraint verification. So that poses a, a very interesting technical question. How should we generate? You know, we have a solver. The solver gives us a solution. You know, how does it, what solution does it give us? It depends on the internal, depends on the heuristic. You know, it's the, it just seat of the pan. We don't know what it gives you. And we would like to cover the test space somewhat uniformly. Imagine that, uh, that uh, you go to the theater and, and someone has a, someone is stole popcorn. What is your best, uh, if, you do, if you can't test everybody, what is your best shot of doing it? Just sample at random. So that gives rise to the following problem. Given a SAT formula, a Boolean formula, generate solution uniformly at random. Uniformly at random. So you have a such solver, you can generate solution. That's not good enough. We need to generate solution uniformly at random. And of course, we want to do it for industrial size problems. So it turns out that this problem of cons on cons what I call constraint sampling has many applications. I talk about test generation. Um, you know, one of the most interesting applications so was for MOOCs, when you may have 50,000 students taking a course and if you give if you give them a homework assignment, you can't give just one assignment to everyone because they'll share information. So how do you generate fifty thousand different different uh, problems? So one way to do it is to parameterize the problems, describe constraints, and then generate problems at randoms. And in the context of uh, of machine learning, if we have probabilistic inference, we have probabilistic models. We want to uh, again, sample solution. We have some evidence. Now we want to sample possible solution. This all required. This all can be reduced to constraint sampling. And the problem have been studied going back by theoretician going back to the to the mid 80s. And by 2000, there was a paper that offered a definitive solution. It by was Bellari, Goldrach, and Petrank. I call it the BGP. And the paper was uniform generation of, of NP witnesses using an NP oracle, like such solver is an NP oracle. And the algorithm is uh, in BPP to the NP. BPP means randomized polynomial time. And with an NP oracle, such solver is an oracle. 
So when I started working on it in the, about a decade ago, at first told the student, Kuldeep Mill, who worked with me, let's implement this algorithm. So he implemented it, and it did not scale above 16 variables. And he said, oh, this is great, let's publish a paper. I said, people will laugh at us if we submit a paper for n equals 16. Because now they are solving problems with hundreds of thousands, millions of variables, and we are going to come up with 16, 16 variables. It will be a joke. We have to scale it bigger. So we've been spending now um, more than a decade just about scaling it, scaling it, scaling it, which require better theory and more algorithmic engineering and software engineering, building good tools. There are other approaches that people use. Uh, people use suggesting to use BDDs. So if you have a BDD, then you can uh, figure out, you can assign weights to each node in the BDD, depending on how many paths you have to the one terminal, and then you can generate solutions uniformly at random. But it's BDDs, we know you cannot, BDDs do not scale more than uh, maybe a thousand variables. That's pretty bad, actually even less, maybe 800 variables. After that, the BDD explodes. It's too large. There is a classical approach that people use for sampling. This is very classical. It's called the, the, the Metropolis algorithm. And it's called, it's a MCMC, Monte Carlo Markov chain. And it's a method that gives you good scalability in the, following, in the following way. You create some Markov chain. This is, one can give a whole lecture just on that. Then you take a random walk. And then you stop at some point, and it should give you a, a, a uniform. That will be give you uniform, uniform sampling. But to do really uniform sampling, you have to go exponentially long, which takes too long. So people do in practice, they don't go that far. They 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 take a random walk. At some point, they stop it, and then they say that's the sample. How uniform is it? Actually, it's not very uniform. People don't experiment. Uniformity is is fairly poor. So there is a tension between uniformity and scalability. So based on the theory that was developed by theoreticians in the, in the, as we said, all the way to the BGP, um, together with uh, Supratik Chakraborty, Daniel Fremont, Kuldeep Mill, uh, Sanjit Cheshire, and myself, we, we show how you, you redo the theory, and then you get almost uniform generation in BPP to the NP. Again, BPP to the NP is random polynomial time with Sat Oracle, almost uniform, I'll explain. How do we do it? Use universal hashing and SM, SMT solver. I'll explain both. And we scale it to hundreds of thousands of variables. So what is almost uniformity? Well, uniformity means that if you have kappa solution, the probability of each solution is 1 over kappa. And that's, as we said, that's very difficult to do. Instead, we have a factor epsilon. And your probability is going to be within a factor of 1 plus epsilon from the ideal probability, which is 1 over kappa. So each solution would be almost almost uniform. So that's, first of all, we compromise a little bit, but you can tune you can tune epsilon as you want. Of course, you pay a price. The smaller epsilon, the more expensive it is. How do we do this? The idea is to take the, the whole solution space, divide it into uniformly, uniformly uh, uh, roughly uniformly small cell. Then you pick a random cell and you sample, a dead cell has a small number of solutions, so you can enumerate them and sample uniformly. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, how do we partition this space that we don't fully understand, right? It's a space of solution into equally small cells. Here we use universal hashing. So you remember that a hash function takes 0, 1 to the n, map it, let's say, to 0, 1 to the m, where n is much larger than m. Now, a good, a good hash function will take random inputs and map them uniformly. But here we don't know that, uh, in general, you don't know that the, the, the input space is uniform, probably not uniform. There's a lot of passwords that people choose, clearly not uniform. So Carter and Wegman came up with a beautiful idea to have a universal family of hash function where you choose, you randomize, instead of randomizing the input, which you cannot control, you choose the hash function at random. And then with high probability, it will, the, the mapping will be uniform. That means you'll get, the cells will be roughly equal in expectation. And how do you do it in our context? In our context, you, you have CNF formula, and you add XOR constraints. What is an XOR constraint? It's going to be a random equation, X1 plus X2 plus 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 plus, let's say equal 0 or 1, 
you put every every variable there with with probability half so you have about n over two variables and you can see that this will split the solution base into two now it's not a geometric split but split it into two if you have m such xor constraint you'll have to do the m cells and if you have enough cells you'll make the cell small enough but now to solve a cell we have a combination of cnf and xor constraints and this is such solvers are not good at it per se but the whole theory develop of smt which is sat plus some other theory and again this this has shown tremendous progress in the last 20 years and we stumbled into a solver called crypto mini sat by matesus it was specialized for cnf and exos because it combines such solving with gaussian elimination these kind of equations which are just equations modulo 2 can be solved using gaussian elimination and we get a performance that's our performance remember it's almost uniform but statistically it's, it, it is indistinguishable from uniform sampler which we have we have compared and in terms of performance we got uh, two orders of magnitude and more improvement over previous samplers like exo sample prime and the previous sampler did not offer any guarantee of uniformity while we offer a guarantee a formal guarantee of almost uniformity so I want to do some reflection now before I close. One is that when I was a, a graduate student, NP-complete problems were considered scary. But today we solve NP-complete problems with huge industrial NP-complete problems. And complexity theory doesn't fully explain it. It's a real mystery. And in fact, a book was just published last year, Beyond Wars Has Complexity, by Tim Rafgard as editor, which is how do we explain our success on solving this, uh, this NP-complete problem? We think they are hard, but in practice they are not so hard. And how can we leverage that? And what kind of complex theory do we need to do that? But I want to close on, on, the, on how I started. We are facing here not paradigm glide, but paradigm shift. And I think data-driven computer science refine model-driven computer science. I say when I, I my undergraduate major was in physics and you know year one of physics you study classical physics mechanics electromagnetism optics only later you go to to more modern physics but uh, but essentially you spend year one doing 19th century physics because this is the basic the basic for all of physics and we have to figure out how to bridge the gap between machine learning and logic to get human centered AI Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moshe. I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so my apologize uh, to the virtual audience uh, that I was only the, recognized by the audience here in the lecture room uh, at the very beginning. But nonetheless, um, now we are, we are back on track. Uh, so maybe for the moment, is there any urgent question to Moshe concerning clarification of some aspect? Check the audience, the live audience and the other audience. So fine. So in the meantime, I might ask Martino to, to set up for the next talk. So Moshe, I hope you can stay with us. I will stay for the whole session, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Then at the end, we have, we have a discussion about all the topics together. Yeah. Yep. And I now am happy to introduce Martina Lindorfer from our university, uh, where she is assistant professor. Um, yeah, she received several awards already, huh, as far as I, I, I remember. And, and so she's, she's working in the area of, of, of privacy and security. And again, without uh, much further ado, and, and Thank over you. to you, Martina. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so yeah, my research, I'm more on the software engineering side um, and come from a background of applied security, um, software testing, and started with um, actually, yeah? okay. Um, testing the apps or programs we have on our computers for malicious behavior. But along the way, um, what we found is that nowadays, a lot of apps we just have on our phones actually have behavior that you could kind of classify as malicious already. 
So what we're doing is um, we're performing automated software testing on this, this farm of smartphone devices where we execute um, different kinds of apps and monitor the behavior to um, see what kind of data they're accessing and where they're sending it to. So in a brief overview, um, if we take our phones, um, install them on the device, um, interact with them on the large, like we're not manually interacting with any devices. So um, the goal is to be able to scan hundreds of thousands of apps automatically. So we are also building techniques to um, automatically interact with the apps to like similar to our user would do and then intercept the network traffic to um, look for which kind of data is, is it's going to a different server, different, different servers. Um, one of the, that was an early prototype we already built in 2016. So we've been working on this for a while. There's always the question, so we're doing a lot of measurement studies, but what's the benefit of, for the user ultimately? And um, unfortunately this so far is only a prototype, but our idea was having this interface for users where they could see in real time um, the data that apps were accessing. And then um, on the other hand, also giving our system feedback if we were correctly classifying different types of information. And finally, giving the user the chance to either block connections to certain servers or replace information. As if you're like um, looking for a restaurant in Vienna, um, the restaurant app needs to know in which city you're in, but it doesn't need to know your exact location at all times and probably also share it with Facebook and Google and whatever library is in the app. So yeah, that was a prototype that we used for a small scale user study. We also did a larger scale study where we yeah, looked at apps for 2016, 2018 to see um, is the situation getting worse or not, um, which, yeah. So um, what we found is we analyzed different versions of, of a handful of, or handful, hundreds of apps. And um, one very depressing thing was that while we slightly, we're getting these new privacy features on our Android and iOS phones, but ultimately um, progress is really, really slow. slow. Apps are not really adopting new privacy features because they're not required to. And then on the other hand, when we were trying to compare these different apps, one open challenge is also, how do you quantify if this one app is more privacy friendly than the other? Or how this one app is more secure than the other? We have this checklist we're looking for, for security vulnerabilities, but still it's, there's no consensus on, on any proper metrics on how to compare different systems and apps. So um, another project we did was um, on looking at if you have an app that can access the camera, what does it do with the data it has? Because we are always asked, we know Facebook has access to the microphone, it's always listening, it has to because its recommendations are so great. Anyway, um, so in this project, um, we looked at what type of media is, is collected by apps and found that, you know, this photo filter apps that you can use that um, on your selfies that make your face either look older or younger or add makeup or whatnot. You would think that those apps process the data on the device and then let the user decide whether they should share, want to share it on social media or not. Thing is, um, not necessarily. And we found a lot of apps that even surprised us, even though we kind of always expect the worst. Those apps are might be able to process the data on the device, but they're still sending it to some server. In, in this example, um, the InstaBeauty, it sends it to some server in the US on Amazon Cloud um, in an unsecure way. So anybody on, for example, the university campus could intercept the data and see what kind of pictures you're taking. Um, if you look at the privacy policy, they're at least straightforward that you give them a license to the photos you're taking, but um, not that many people actually read this. So another example that was in the news a couple of years ago was the space app that was super popular on Twitter. Everybody was posting their, their photos. Um, the thing was in this case, the app was from Russia and in the US there were the security concerns. Now Russia is creating a photo face database from, from all of our citizens, which might be a legitimate concern. And it's, I wanna stress, it's not only about different countries receiving the photos. It's also, you know, the companies are building huge databases of people's faces for face recognition and so on. So it's actually some very valuable data. Um, how this issue with FaceApp was resolved was that in the beginning, or at first they had in the Play Store the contact address in Russia. Afterwards, they just replaced it with essentially a mailbox address in the US. And now everybody's happy. 
Um, another app we found was, yeah, they had a developer in the Netherlands, but if you look at the company, it's owned by a Russian company and actually also sends all your images to Russia. And in the privacy policy, it's not even related to the app. They have a privacy policy because they have to, but yeah, there's nothing really in there. Um, another issue was also we, in our data set that turned up the screenshots of, of different apps, which was kind of surprising. Um, and we found that there's the services developers can include in the app, not maliciously, like they wanna improve the, the quality and usability of the apps and trace where users are clicking to make it more usable. But ultimately they're collecting screenshots of how users are interacting with the app while you're typing messages, while you're typing in your credit card information. And yeah, um, we disclosed this to Google. We also quite got some press responses. Um, in this case, the companies that provide those libraries threatened to uh, sue us because that was their business. Um, Google wasn't that happy. They gave us some vague response of they're monitoring the apps they have in the Play Store anyway, and they, they took the appropriate actions, which uh, the appropriate action is the apps now have a line in the privacy policy that says we're doing this. And yeah, this concludes kind of the first part of my talk because yeah, privacy policies are a fun thing. Um, there's several uh, also art projects on how to visualize them and actually show how incomprehensible and long they've been getting. And there's been also some interesting studies on how many days people would actually need to spend out of the working year if they would read the privacy policy of every website and every app they're using. In this regard, there's some nice developments, actually. So I was uh, really looking forward to this. Um, Apple announced that they're introducing these privacy labels in the, in the iOS store. So every app is required to um, tell the users in a predefined format which kind of data they're collecting and also sharing. And then there's also some details. So it's a nice overview. The thing is, if you look at the fine print, um, this information is something the developer provides, but there's, of course, Apple doesn't take any responsibility to, to verify this information. Um, and as maybe not surprising, um, I just had a master student looking into this and um, he only analyzed a small sample of apps for now and only looked for one specific type of information. But even in this case, 25% or a quarter of the apps declared they're not collecting any data, but they're still sending tracking identifiers around. Um, Google is also announcing these kinds of labels. Um, they announced it last year, they're postponed when they're actually gonna be enforced. Um, but they have this, this point in there that um, they're gonna offer independent security review. There's not really any details yet on how this um, will look like, but it's, um, I find an interesting, potentially good development for user privacy. But on the other hand, since I'm working with verifying and, and measuring what apps are doing, it's also not that trivial to like, give a check mark to the app and, and verify the behavior under all circumstances. Because, yeah, mobile apps are super complex. Um, also, as a side note, um, if you look at the Google Play Store, Google claims that the Play Store is like the safe garden. You shouldn't download any apps from any other sources. They verify everything, but ultimately they don't. It's always about shifting responsibility around and, and tossing the ball of responsibility for, for what the apps are doing. And um, Apple has similar wording in their, in their things. And as we've seen before, they, not very, they don't verify the information they're getting from developers. Um, but still, um, the DuckDuckGo Go browser had this as an advertisement. Like, you can at least use the labels to get a brief idea about what different apps claim to, to use. And the difference between, for example, the DuckDuckGo browser and Google Chrome is pretty, pretty significant. Um, that's also one of our research projects right now. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but Browsers are also the special kind of app where we essentially trust them. Um, we're visiting all kinds of different websites and are worried about the cookie banners we have on the websites. But on the other hand, the browser is between the website and the user and theoretically could inject any information you want, uh, 
any scripts they want, extract any information. Um, but on the positive, positive side, also block tracker scripts and increase user privacy and security. And this is what we are trying to measure right now. Um, but I can only tell you there's a huge range of what browsers are doing, but they're currently finalizing the results. Um, one point I also want to make is that when we're talking about apps, it's not necessarily the developers that are collecting information. It's just usual that all kinds of apps nowadays have different third party libraries um, integrated for monetizing their apps or just using different services and decreasing their development effort. And on the one hand, um, when you, this is um, for the example of TikTok, how many trackers there are. So it looks like the number of trackers decreased, but on the other hand, it's also the big companies such as buying smaller tracker companies and getting on their user base. And what I found interesting in this example, it's like it's one social network, the TikTok app, but then it shares data with the Facebook app, with Google and with different other, other libraries. And yeah, this is only kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, there was none of your business is doing a great job of going after certain apps that are especially um, privacy unfriendly. And for example, in this case, um, they looked at Grindr. So the app itself had 19 different third party or contacted 19 different third parties. But through partners and partners and data brokers, ultimately um, the data from one user was shared with over 4,000 different partners. So what um, yeah, another open topic. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it short so we can have a discussion afterwards. But um, so we started with mobile apps, but nowadays um, everything is kind of connected to the internet. We all have our smartwatches and smart toasters and light bulbs and whatnot. And typically in security and privacy research, what people, what people are doing is with the picture um, on the left, they just buy a handful of devices and look at them and see if they can add, identify any vulnerabilities, which then make huge headlines. The thing is, there's thousands of, dif thousands of different devices out there. And what we know is they're still, unfortunately, not really built with security and privacy in mind. It's always getting the product to the market as fast as possible. And yeah. Um, so be yeah, this is one fun example I always like to show is it also shows how sensitive those devices can be. Those are children's toys that had Microsoft uh, microphones embedded um, and that pretty much had any vulnerability you can, you can ask for. And those um, devices were um, remote controlled by an app where the parents could use this as a monitor for their sleeping babies or talk to the children. And the data itself was stored on a third party server or on the server of the company but left completely unsecured. So we currently have a project like what to do. We can't buy all the devices that are out there and, and test them for vulnerabilities. So um, we have right now a project funded by the WWTF where we are trying to, if we only look at the apps on a mobile device that control all these different um, IoT devices, how much information can we gain about their security posture and about the backends they're communicating with? Um, it looks promising, but it, it, it's currently an open project. Um, of course, we're still buying a couple of devices to verify how um, our techniques work, but ultimately, essentially every device has a companion app because of course you wanna turn off the lights or turn on the light at home while you're still at work. So nowadays even, yeah, everything is pretty much in the internet, but still the way that these devices communicate with the companion app on a mobile phone is the same or similar to how they communicate over the internet. So this way, um, we have some promising results. Promising and also kind of depressing. <laughs> um, so what we found so far is that these companion apps communicate with the typical trackers that you would find in, in any other um, mobile app, but also some very specific trackers that we're, we're looking into. And one thing to keep in mind here um, is you have your app on your phone and it asks you for permission if it wants to access the location or your address book or what any sensor on the device but if the companion app talks to your 
light bulb. Um, it can just take the data from the light bulb, use it however it wants, and send it to wherever it wants because there's just no permission for any data that those IoT devices are collecting. It all just goes straight to the apps that it technically have all these permissions, but there's just no permission management for, for any IoT devices um, as soon as they're connected to the internet. Is this? I'm already on my final another topic, so I'm hoping we can have some discussions afterwards. But um, another project we're doing is also now we know that where all our data is going um, and who receives the data, who's actually behind different servers. Um, and we this is a case study not on IoT apps or on mobile apps, which we are planning to do, but we started just looking at in-house at the university, what are actually the backends and servers that are handling all our data and all our services? And how dependent are we on just a small number of companies? And I'm sure the picture is the same for any app you have on the phone. Ultimately, any app and any service nowadays is outsourced to the clouds. And if it's in the cloud, it's either with Google, Amazon, or Microsoft. And yeah. We did this measure that was kind of a passion project for us in the university context um, because we necessarily, we as computer scientists have the ability to build our own cloud services and services in-house, but just all of academia is nowadays dependent on the technical services from these big companies just because it's cheaper and, and universities like this, they can outsource stuff and it's cheaper and we don't have to hire personnel to take care of our services, but still, um, yeah. A point that we should discuss, in my opinion. And with that, yeah, also for further discussion, another point that I find interesting to discuss is now that Google and Apple are doing essentially for marketing these privacy labels and to tell users that they are now so more secure because they can see what the apps are doing, but there's, yeah, it's essentially marketing. There's not much behind it if you can't verify what, if the information that developers provide is actually correct. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, uh, something to digest, no, in particular the, the sheer amount of information in this condensed form. Uh, nonetheless, maybe just a question from my, my side at, at that point, but you know, it's also for me to prepare for the discussion. So if you want to, if you would put now at the end, so to say, a, a research challenge, right? in connection with digital humanism in relation to what you have said. What would, what would be the, the challenge to tackle? The verification of my verification of behavior of the OK. I think, is there any other say, urgent question for clarification? Carlo, please. Uh, yeah, this is very similar. <laughs> 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 ah, sorry, yeah, please. Thanks, so, Thanks. No, uh, I, th this is a very quick question. You know, you gave a very scary picture of what is going on. Uh, actually, my question is, uh, do you have an idea of how much awareness, you know, for example, you know, everybody is downloading uh, apps on phones. Uh, so how much awareness do you think that there is you know, among people of uh, the problems that you raised. You, did, I mean, did you uh, ever went back to people or sampled people and, you know, saying, you know, this is actually what happens. What do you think? Have you thought about this? So I think there's two things. Um, on the one hand, awareness is growing, but people don't understand the complexity. They're like, this app is collecting my location and different data points, but they have no understanding how this data then is actually used and how much you can infer from it. And then on the other hand is, yeah, but it's so convenient. And there's a lot of peer pressure to use different messengers and just, even if you know that an app is not perfectly secure or shares your data, sometimes you just use it because you have to use it at work or because it's convenient or your friends are using it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Martina. So I now hand over to Brigitte Gray. Very happy to have you here today. So Brigitte is, is co uh, deputy director of the Austrian Research Institute for AI. 
Ö5, call it here. Um, yeah, and she's, she's an expert in, in natural language processing, formerly also had a position in, in Saarbrücken. And the slides are ready. Yeah, and, and I think we, we uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, I think we shouldn't really waste time because I, your talk, Martina, was really impressing. I know all this, yeah, um, or a lot of it. Uh, but when I see it in so condensed, I'm just, and, and when I think what I'm doing, I'm doing the convenient stuff. Uh, so, and what could we do? Um, there is so much uh, we have to agree upon or, or to, to, to tick, uh, okay, uh, get, the, get another cookie, get another cookie in order just to read a newspaper article, for instance, from whatever newspaper I'm not uh, uh, having um, uh, uh, paid access to. Yeah. Uh, so th there is so much and okay, so um, I'm from natural language processing and what I'm interested in basically is uh, how do we find out what's in natural language uh, coming from computational linguistics. Uh, I come basically, or well, I came from text at the beginning and this is still what I'm doing in an applied uh, context, but I'm also interested in modeling uh, human language capabilities, which might be dangerous, but we are so at the beginning, which I, then I'm always saying, okay, you know, we're so at the beginning and the methods are so, um, don't do what, what they claim to do. Natural language understanding is just one of those uh, taglines, which is absolutely ridiculous. We don't understand natural language, but still we can do a lot of, uh, things which might be useful and other things which uh, won't be so useful. Um, I try to talk about things which uh, have been uh, and still are useful when uh, monitoring uh, user-generated content. Um, so what we do in, in OFI since many years is to work together with the standard, which is an online newspaper uh, it's a newspaper a printed newspaper but which was one of the early uh, european newspapers who, who did pr uh, print and started then to do online and then you've got a lot of user comments and more and more user comments so each article has its uh, form and people are discussing in the forum so that's the standard thing um, and what we uh, were asked to in back 2002, three was to help the, the, the journalists um, to uh, read all these comments um, and decide whether a comment could go uh, online or not. Because the difference between a newspaper and um, something like Facebook or um, this uh, similar things is that the newspaper is liable on what they are posting on their um, service and, and in, in their medium. And so we started to do uh, machine learning, a classical machine learning task by then and learn a classifier which distinguishes uh, postings um, from uh, being should, that should be more, uh, I say the bad word, censored or not go uh, online and postings which are safe to be just uh, pushed to the um, website. And then there is this uh, amount of postings where the uh, classifier is not so sure in which directions it should go. So the human has to look at. And the goal was just to reduce the human labor uh, by a certain um, percentage. and. After the years, uh, of course, there's more and more user-generated content going on and more and more discussion going on. And so uh, it's impossible to do it manually. So we have to have the system. So we have this pre-moderation. And then when the postings are out in the forum, we have the post-moderation that could happen, uh, that there is uh, content which is desirable. Uh, for instance, the uh, newspaper has their uh, ideas of how diverse a discussion should be, how uh, different uh, positions should be fostered in, in a forum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and of course, how uh, particular discussions 
uh, well, sh should be kind of um, softened, uh, which we can't do with the machine, but we can do with alerting people and alerting moderators uh, to go there and start a discussion, so send a human in, but the human needs to find where to go in. So without the technology, uh, you absolutely can forget it. Um, and uh, as, a, as an example, I uh, use um, pre-moderation, which is uh, an, an old decision tree. So it went online 2004. So everybody who you can imagine what kind of technology is this. And it's, well, it's, yeah, it's a, an, an old version of a decision tree. Um, uh, the, the escalation board was uh, so this basic idea to uh, kind of calm down when the emotions go up or early find out when emotions are going up uh, and then trying to send a human aid to calm uh, the, the discussion down. At the end, it was, it turned out that it was much more useful with all the, the classes we were looking in or the, the, the contents uh, to uh, have some, some of desirable contents identified and so that they could be re-ranked and that when you go into the forum, you, you see them and can read them first and not just the uh, posts which are the most recent ones. So this is just to, to highlighting uh, particular topics in a form. Um, and the third one is uh, the, uh, the last one we, we just recently um, finished. This was really to uh, identify uh, misogynist uh, um, postings in, in order to uh, create a, a context where uh, women uh, tend to uh, post which is not uh, so, so that, that's something we, we really have to uh, kind of uh, focus more on. Um, so this, this is just um, a few numbers from a study which uh, the standard did with uh, approximately 2000 uh, users they were asking. And it was about how much time do uh, people who post actively spend in the forum, post them actively. And the difference you see, uh, half of women do this compared to men. And we only can find it out by asking people because we don't know when we look at the post and uh, look at the, um, at the profiles, the user profiles, we don't know whether these are uh, female or male. Um, also, how much time uh, people spend in the forum um, so men, again, more than women, um, and women attach much more importance to a constructive discussion. And so that's why at the end we uh, sort of, well, yeah, um, and they are more often uh, subject to derogative postings, and the derogative is a sexist posting. Uh, and that's much more uh, facing women than this is the case for men. And so women really uh, often decide not uh, to uh, post anymore. So we've got a clearly a silencing effect. And this is a uh, part of the uh, society doesn't uh, take part of, in the discussions. Um, well, uh, talking about uh, multidisciplinary, so uh, just in, in order to uh, realize these classifiers, uh, we urgently had to uh, have people from different uh, perspectives. So we need to have the domain experts, in this case, the moderators, because we, when as, as computer scientists, uh, data scientists, uh, machine learners, um, we, we don't know what the goal and the result should be, because we don't know the domain as by heart. Uh, and the methods addressed are, on the one hand, the corpus creation. So we need to create the data we learn from. And on the other hand, all the methods uh, we use for, for learning, for learning the models. And when you just look at uh, what I've uh, written down, you, you really see uh, this is depending on when the system was uh, 
implemented. Uh, we have the whole history of uh, machine learning. Um, and this is also gives us a hint of how important it also is to get access to the data and to have a broader access to the data. Exactly the, uh, diff, diff, so the other way around, it's kind of us, for us, privacy is more hindering than helping. Uh, for instance, with the misogyny classifier, we have the problem that we can't publish anything uh, because the data are not freely available. We're really struggling and fighting for getting uh, a permission to, to, to uh, make the, the corpus publicly available so that people can extend the corpus, can work with it, and also new methods can be used to train new classifiers. So. Uh, on the one hand, having access to data and giving data uh, away freely to a broad group of people uh, is something desirable. On the other hand, uh, we have to be careful with our data. Um, yeah. And when, when I, I just want to talk about the data and, and uh, some related issues, um, we have to, Again, as I already said, the com combined this knowledge of domain experts and machine learning people, because otherwise um, we wouldn't have uh, the data or the right data to learn uh, proper models from with them. And their models wouldn't basically do what they should do. Uh, uh, then the next thing is the creating the annotation guideline, but because we always work in, in this case with uh, supervised learning. So we need to know uh, what we need to annotate, which was quite a tricky thing with the uh, sexism, uh, because if you think of it, when, when you read postings and then you have to decide, is this is that sexism mean or not? Uh, there is a lot of uh, personal impression and we have to account for this. So at the end, we decided we will have a, label system so we had these annotation guidelines uh, defining what is sexism what is not sexism which cases etc different examples and then we had this label system say from what so either not sexistic and then from one to four uh, being mildly sexistic to being uh, harshly sexist yeah and then when we uh, looked into the uh, comparison as when we compared the annotators so every posting was annotated by three people uh, not always the same, uh, three different, so, so we had eight people in total to, to do the annotations and three uh, for, for, for each posting. And we had, um, in each of these three, there were two moderators huh? and one person outside of, of this uh, domain. Yeah? And uh, we have got with a lot of um, disagreement. Uh, here I just brought some examples. Um, for the German speaking people, the Uberfahrerinnen fahren großteils sowieso automatisch und können nicht mit einem Knüppel umgehen. I'm not sure whether the translation is sort of uh, gives, uh, uh, gives a hint on what it is. Um, and then we have three annotators, so the A1 to, to A3, uh, going from zero, not success to uh, two, which is kind of medium, to, uh, so four is uh, the, the highest number, uh, and three is uh, kind of uh, rather quite success. Uh, you, you see, uh, and this is uh, just a personal evaluation. Huh? And uh, the problem is hard, right? Um, I'm doing a classifier is is uh, is a hard thing to do uh, for the manual annotations we we, we had uh, uh, approximately eight thousand or seven thousand uh, nine hundred postings labeled on a scale from zero to, to uh, four uh, and the uh, agreement of course you can imagine was rather low um, and of course, it's often a matter of opinion. And what we also have here, when you say a matter of opinion, the opinion changes over the time. Uh, what is uh, called sexist today was maybe not called sexist when I was a kid. So I remember going into uh, pubs in rural areas where it was completely normal to kind of 
<laughs> you know, uh, you wouldn't do that anymore. And also how people talk about it. So what we need, if we have a, a, a sexism classifier, we need to have something which is learning over the time, or we need to do the retraining. But it's not, it, it's not one at, at a time and that's it. Um, okay, you see the overall agreements and that stuff. That's, uh, and, and, and we were quite, uh, yeah, <laughs> the classifiers did rather well. They got rather close so the, um, to human performance. Um, and um, just two slides, not which is just thoughts. Um, so, a class, so all those classifiers we do for, for, for post moderation, uh, where we try to find particular topics or uh, particular content in, in, in forum posts, um, they really need to have this tight cooperation between the domain experts from both sides, yeah? between the people who know about the content and what the what, what, the, what, what their goal is, because the goal of the newspaper and standard being uh, having a particular goal in, in, in the, how they conceive their role in society. So, and if you don't have this part of the knowledge when developing the data, you can't create a model which is appropriate and would do the thing. Uh, and also, if you don't know how to deal with data and do machine learning, you can't do that. So you ultimately need those two together. Um, and also in the model application, so the, the, the overall goal is to help the moderators to find relevant utterances, let's say. But what they then do uh, and how they kind of evaluate it, how they use this in their daily work is their decision. The model or the system can only help uh, to find in a huge pile of, of things something which is relevant. And it's everything we do in natural language processing is not 100%. So in many cases, we, yeah, we are happy if we are at let's say 80%, yeah? or sometimes even 67% or something. Yeah? So we need the human in, in the whole process. Uh, another thing is who, is access, who has access to the data and how is this regulated? As I told you, our problem is that we don't have access to the data uh, and we, we can't do anything further with it and the community can't do anything further and it can kind of be improved and the data can't be uh, made uh, larger or uh, with different annotations, etc. Um, so here we need, um, we have uh, on the one hand privacy laws, uh, which are too restrictive. On the other hand, we have uh, big companies which just use the data however they want because we can't control it anyway. Uh, so we have this dichotomy here. Um, and we also have this imbalance between a publicly funded research, which is comparably small, it's uh, fragmented, and then we have the, the, the really big um, internet companies, which just do what they want, basically, and we can't even, we, we don't know. Um, and the last slide, we also have underrepresented languages. So German, for instance, is an underrepresented language. When we do natural language processing, almost everything and the kind of uh, best developed uh, parts are for English, full stop. Um, so German is, um, compared to other minor languages, rather developed in, in, in terms of tools, resources, etc. So, but on the other hand, when you say German, most of the machine learning models are German German. Yeah? We have standard Austrian German, standard Swiss German. Uh, and uh, when you ever have tried to do uh, automatic uh, speech recognition <laughs> and try to do it with Austrian, and it's not uh, some real dialect, you know what it is about. Um, then we have in machine learning, just from, from, from a, a very uh, narrow perspective of uh, natural language processing. Uh, we learn from skewed data. We have, uh, when, when we look at the, at the data, the 
and, and different categories. The uh, numbers are, we have in the, uh, according to the categories are different, but also the positive and the negative examples. This is a standard thing when you work with real data. Um, we um, need to learn from small data. When we need to annotate data, we definitely need to learn from small data. So that's we were, we are doing transfer learning and stuff like that. And we kind of can do okay with a few thousand data. Um, but we can train the base models. Yeah? If we uh, would train really a big, big, big base model for German or for the varieties of German, we wouldn't have uh, the money and the resources to train it. So it's again somewhere at the big companies. Um, we uh, actually we would need continuous learning because uh, the opinions and, and the, uh, what changes. So what, what is uh, sexist changes? Yeah? just as an example, but many other things change over time. And uh, we haven't updated the uh, format since 2004, for instance. Yeah? So, and um, we, we also need to overcome this shortcut in learning where uh, correlations kind of uh, go for uh, causal relations. Yeah? That's, um, and, and we have also this, uh, I think we, we have to be more aware of, maybe we as researchers are, but uh, the, everybody should be more aware of this dichotomy of narrow AI and general AI. And that it doesn't mean that, so all our systems, at least when we do uh, classic, so machine learning are narrow AI. They are just for a specific purpose because I have to, to twist uh, uh, the data, I have to do a uh, hyperparameter search, etc., uh, etc. Et and this is just for a particular uh, application, or, and that's it. And th this is far away from being general for something, yeah? Um, and uh, I think we, we, we have to, at, at least in, in, in this area I've been talking about, we have to mo much more think of, AI or machine learning as a tool for the human. It's like a hammer. It looks a bit different. Or it's like a disc brush with, with more capabilities. So that's my humble opinion on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brigitte. So before entering in the discussion, is there a, a question direct to Brigitte? So we have yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So we see. So we see. We see. The people coming. At least it's flickering. It's broken. No, we have to have a light. So I think it's there. It's there, but it's not the reflection. Yeah, it's been a long day. What is the machine? <laughs> oh, there, oh there they are again. Okay. Hello, people at home. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Burkita. That was really, really interesting. And um, there were a couple of things I, I, yeah, I wanted to ask. Did you need to get ethical approval to do this project? Um, and I'm asking for kind of two reasons. One, you know, you had human coders for the intercoder reliability, and probably for them, it wasn't a lot of fun having to read all of this misogynist content. Um, so I think ethical approval is also about protecting the researcher as well as protecting research subjects. So I was kind of curious about that. And I think that's also another imbalance between publicly funded, you know, scholarly research or, um, and private companies. I mean, we do hear stories of, you know, Facebook people who spend days looking at child porn, um, you know, having really horrible time and okay, they just hire more when some of them burn out. But, you know, I think in academia, we have a different kind of ethical responsibility. So I think it's important for several reasons to think about what are the ethics of this kind of research. And also as we're at the end of the day, and I'll, it reminded me a lot of when I was learning Dutch and I had one, this was the advanced class and our homework was to 
come to the next class with three swear words in Dutch. <laughs> and the teacher then, this was 20 years ago, wrote them on the blackboard and then she classified them and said, okay, these are about men, these are about women, um, this is stronger than that, this you must never, ever, ever say. Um, it was one of the most useful Dutch lessons I'd ever had. Um, and, uh, um, and then as we were leaving, she said, oh, I've got to kind of rub all of this out. Otherwise, my colleagues are going to come in and wonder what I'm teaching you all. But um, yeah, that's a kind of by the way. But I, I think, yeah, so I think the kind of ethical issues, I think, are important. And the other qu comment and question was really about, um, I heard a presentation a month or two ago um, from somebody from Microsoft, and they were working on deprioritizing content to not to remove it because this was an American and you know the idea of removing things was just so anti-free speech you just couldn't mm -hmm. cope with it um so they wanted to keep it there but just make it much much harder to find partly because of freedom of speech issues but also because of future historians as you were also suggesting you know people might be interested to understand you know what kind of words were you that were sort of seen as misogynistic in 2020 that were you know how does that change over time is kind of interesting and important. So you don't necessarily want to get rid of stuff, you just want to make it harder to find. The, the uh, sexism which you asked before and the, the other, so, so the, the escalation, but they are post-moderation. And post-moderation that stays, that's already online and this is just online, it's got, it's, it won't be um, deleted, um, it's for, um, for in, in the de-escalation part, it was really to, to find some interesting parts and then rearrange the information, make sure that uh, people can read this when they enter it or uh, people at, at the standard they have, the, they can decide, you can select whether you just want to read from the news uh, to the older ones or you want to have these prioritized ones first. Um, and uh, the de-escalation, uh, the, the uh, Sexism classifier really was for the moderators to what what, what we we looked into was there are uh, for uh, discuss so there are articles discussing more female topics and there are articles discussing more male topics and then we really looked into those articles or the fora of these articles and looked how uh, high uh, how many hits did the classifier give us in the female topics or in the male topics. And we, we knew already from the forum because the moderators went through them and they said, okay, this is a more sexist forum or the, the discussion is more sexist. This is a forum where the discussion is not sexist at all. And we, we really could see that the uh, hits the classifier had on the different fora were comparable to what the people said. So this is a, a, a alert. Imagine you've got thousands of articles live mm. and you can't monitor them, but with this um, mechanism, you can monitor them and then the uh, moderator goes in. So there is there, there are moderators who kind of bring the human part in and then start the discussion or say, okay, come on, uh, that's enough or whatever. Um, this is what was for the second question and for the first question. No, we didn't. Uh, we didn't ask for uh, ethical approval because this was kind of a, a partly um, company project, and they just decided that they wanted to have it. And the moderators, so the people who work and just read the stuff anyway, uh, were the annotators. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. But I think it is an interesting issue what the kind of different expectations and standards are also between social science and humanities in terms of ethical approval and computer science. Because um, I think historically computer science, you know, <laughs> you're just building yeah. machines, you're engineers, yeah. why do you need to get ethical approval? But of course you're yeah. reshaping the world. So it's kind of important. And it makes also a difference to have this uh, sexism classifier for a particular newspaper because they've got their standards and their opinions, what yeah. they, want to have in it or not or to have it as something let's say a general uh, research project where we say okay we want to have a, a sexism classifier for social media and we have annotators from just just a, a group of in indistinguished people not not just one particular group of coming from um, a newspaper and having an agenda yeah 
So I think that's that's a big difference. Okay, so maybe also to, to really have the opportunity to discuss to, to, to discuss the entire session. And Eric, I think you are able to, to, to <laughs> well, but, transform your question perhaps. from a complete one to a more general one to look, all, all the speakers. <laughs> maybe. So um, maybe let me just yeah. before that try also to give a brief summary again of what, what we have heard now in the three talks in order then translated into into input for the for the for the roadmap uh, so i think it was very interesting so with moshe uh, telling us about um, the logic based ai which now transformed in one way or another into into this data driven ai and then we had uh, two talks which talked about data in a different sense no? the data is generated in, in different ways no? the one is is so the unintended no? where the user is not aware that data is, is, is delivered. And then with the user postings, of course, these are things where, where people have an intention to give the data, namely the text they provide. And, and we have heard, of course, that this leads to completely different challenges. All right, the one end we have the privacy issue here. And then as Brigitte said, and you, and you said, it's important to access the data, mm -hmm. huh? the metadata of the users, for instance, which said, uh, about the age and where they are coming from and so on. So that's very interesting to have this Janus say that, uh, say, uh, nature of the data. And what also surprised me is that in all three talks, although they were very different, they had the term verification in it. Right? And I mean, in, in Mosh's talk, it was rather explicit, the verification of software system, of, of programs to some extent. Uh, but you know, said that they were and you want to verify whether the apps do what they pretend. Huh? with the data and, and in, in Brigitte, you had it in the sense that uh, you have to check whether postings violate the rules uh, of, 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 the, of the newspaper, which is also kind of a verification. And my question to, to the, maybe to the speakers then would be, but I also would open the floor, but maybe keep this a question in the, in, in the mind is whether this, this verification aspect is, this, is one of these, this, this, say great challenges uh, in a more concrete way where we need to combine these different AI methods uh, because as soon as I need to verify something, I need kind of a, a rule-based, logic-based specification of something, be it a law, uh, be it a, a program code or, or, or whatsoever, or a set of rules. And yeah, that was my, my, my last comment because this brings us back to this combination of, of logic and data driven AI. So we have maybe one more question first, and then I, 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 I ask the, the speakers to comment a bit. So sorry, Eric. For... No, that's all right. You gave me time to generalize my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it appears to me that, that uh, in all of your talks, you, you also alluded to underlying very fundamental underlying issues that, uh, that, that lie under the surface of what you're doing. So let me give you Maybe I start with Moshe. Um, as much as I think, yes, you're absolutely right. We need this logic. In the old days, we said symbolic and sub-symbolic uh, uh, way of, of doing things. Um, but in the end, explanations by itself is a very difficult question. What, what is an explanation that really satis satisfies us? Because very often explanations are about the purpose of a system. It, it's not just so much on the input side of that neural network. It's also about, you know, what, what did it want to do? And that shapes the concepts in, 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 in the network. So whatever the explanation is going to be, we need to take that into account that in order to do X or Y, uh, the, the, this or that decision came up. So, so I think this is a, there is a really more fundamental question to be asked about what is a good explanation? And in, in, in uh, your sense, uh, in, in your talk, Brigitte, one of my hobbies is, is how bad does a discourse have to be in order to be productive? Because obviously, I mean, we could all talk about Mr. Putin as a person who misbehaved or, you know, that that was really not right. But that's not how we speak and how we want to speak. And there is a good reason for that. We, we, we want to use stronger language and sometimes we need stronger language. And, and I think to make to turn this into something positive, there may be something very important about the fact that you are targeting a small newspaper with journalistic expertise of people who understand what they are trying to 
do in that forum, which is very different from, let's say, regulating online content on Facebook, where everything is out in the open, you know, and you have to come up with general rules for every discourse, every possible discourse. That's possi pro probably not doable. Probably that's the wrong thing to do. And uh, for Martina, I'm really not sure. I just want to add a comment. It seems to me that a lot of what you discovered is just simply illegal. Right? Question mark. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So maybe let's, let's go through the order of the talks. So, Moshe, you may want so, to comment. Yeah. I mean, so Eric raised a very good question, which is what is you know, it's almost a philosophical question, right? What is a good explanation? And uh, I mean, in some sense, we are all, this is a kind of a question, we, we, we write things, you know, you submit a paper, you're making an argument for why, you know, you make an argument why the, the program committee should accept your paper. You have to provide some explanation. And as we know, people disagree. What is a, what is a compelling explanation? I mean, I don't know that I have a good answer. What is a good explanation? What I do know is that it's not a low level explanation. You can say, oh, this neuron fire and then that neuron fire. And so that's the answer, right? We have to have some, you know, it connects to human language, connect to NLP. I think that's kind of a central question that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from, from one angle and then uh, the other speaker came from a very different angle, but it does read the question and perhaps that's where we need also philosophers to come and help us. I mean, I mean, I know from the logic point of view, right? P, if P implies Q and P is true, then Q follows. But it doesn't, human, human mind doesn't always work like that. And it connects the question to the head, which is how do you, how do we combine it with common sense reasoning? You know, that, that uh, if you want to understand comments of people, there's always context. It's, it's very, very difficult to just, if you just read the word, you know, the same comment could be could be could be innocent comment or a very nasty comment, depending on the context in which it lives. Okay, thanks, uh, Moshe. So, I, Martina, maybe you want to come, reply to Eric's question about the legality of what the apps are doing. In the best gray area in the world, it's illegal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's just with the amount of services we're using, with the amount of apps, it's just a game of whack them all going after all of them. We have all these regulations, but in the US it is perfectly legal, unfortunately, I'm afraid. Yeah. Mm. I think um, if I can uh, chime in, uh, if, if you can hear me. I mean, um, yeah, maybe let's have let's say first one round on the podium and then I have you on the on the list as the next one. Okay. This was good. This was a strong moderator. <laughs> yeah, that's like at the standard. <laughs> yeah, Eric, of course, you, you're right. Uh, it depends on, on the policy of the medium, how strong you want people to interact and how strong the language should be. This is one thing, but the other thing is in, in Austria, you've got regulations. So you have got already the pre-moderation, which you have to do. Otherwise, you as a content provider are uh, kind of get, get a problem with the law. Uh, so you have both sides. And a standard, of course, is a absolutely highly moderated and radicated uh, content provider in the forum. Even if you read it, you don't believe it like that because it's dreadful, really, what people are kind of uh, talking about. Uh, but it's highly, it, it, it is already, uh, very kind of behaved and that makes the task even harder because it's more subtle yeah the nasty things are more subtle than they come in a non-moderated uh, social media context okay thank you so for the second round i first have had a comment in the chat by paul timmers uh, maybe i just read it uh, maybe. Uh, so, no. so he says I'm so clumsy with this thing here. Mastering digital complexity should be a core theme in the digital humanism research roadmap, question mark. So I didn't understand. Mastering digital complexity should be a core theme in the digital humanism research roadmap. I mean, it was at a certain point in one of the talks, so 
maybe it's maybe Paul can comment on, 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 on the content. And then I have two raised hands. Paul, are you here? Yes, yeah, shall I? Uh, do you hear me? Maybe briefly explain your question in the in the chat. Yeah, what I what I mean is I was trying to look a little bit at what is kind of like a common theme that uh, comes from the various presentations of this afternoon. And um, complexity, digital complexity, uh, risks to overwhelm us, either on purpose or accidentally. Uh, and uh, as Moshe said, for example, we need to have math, hard software engineering for that. But as others said, perhaps you also need to have legal and policy engineering for that. But anyway, digital complexity is something like has an incompatibility or risk of incompatibility of a, or a real risk for digital humanism. So I tried to condense it in a very short sentence. Should digital complexity be a core theme in the digital humanism roadmap? Okay, thanks Paul for the clarification. Now I hand over to Ed. Maybe let's collect two or three questions from the audience and then ask the panelists to, to reply. So Edward, now it's your turn. Sorry for interrupting before. Okay. No, sorry to interrupt. I, this is always awkward doing these things in hybrid mode. Um, uh, yeah, so on this question of um, uh, what constitutes a useful or valid explanation, I think there's a key insight that you can get from Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which Moshe mentioned, um, which is that humans are actually very good at coming up with um, uh, post hoc rationalizations that are explanations of decisions that they made. But in many situations, it's actually demonstrable that these explanations are invalid, that they, that they don't actually explain how the human came about, it came to that decision. And in fact, I would conjecture that someone before long using, using GAN, using generative adversarial networks, is going to figure out how to train a, a deep neural network to give a valid explanation for, or, or a convincing explanation for any decision. So you just give it um, the, the data, the decision, and it will come up with a, a convincing explanation. Um, humans do this. Um, so I don't see any particular reason why we shouldn't be able to create an AI that does this. So I'll tell you a funny, a funny story about this. So one of the universities in the UC system is University of California at Santa Cruz, which was founded in the 60s. It was a very liberal school. And one of the things they decided when they founded it, they didn't like numerical grades. How can you reduce the, 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 a human being to just a, a, a number between a zero and a hundred? It seems not humane. So they, instead they require uh, professors to give what's called narrative evaluation. For each student, you have to write a paragraph that assess the evaluation of the, of the student in the course. And one of my colleagues at the computer science department wrote a program he would give numerical grades and the program would, would generate a paragraph of narrative evaluation that he can then submit and be in compliance of the rules. So exactly what you have proposed, Edward. <laughs> Maybe let's have a third question for this round. So I see one more hand. So it's an issue you will uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. My question is actually for Moshe and actually maybe related also to Ed Lee. The, the, so, and here, here's the question. Here's first of all an observation. It seems to me that humans are able to explain how they came to a decision because we are able to simultaneously in real time work at many meta levels, uh, not only the problem at hand, but we can observe ourselves solving it. We can observe ourselves, observe ourselves solving it. We can remember and compare it with how we solved other problems before. We have mental models of other people and how they solve it. And we can compare it with that. And all of these inform how we explain how we solved a particular problem. So it seems to me there's an architecture here of many, many layers of models uh, inherent in how we do things. And it seems to me in the machine learning phase, we, we are nowhere close to that. Uh, and it seems to me that's a prerequisite for being able to have explainable uh, solutions, uh, explainable decisions. What, what do you think about that? Okay. People like, uh, like you first, and then let's let's compute the round. Moshe. Yeah, 
Uh, there, are, there are researchers in AI, like, like Cynthia Rudin, I think at Duke, who argues against explainable AI. And he said, if you have very, very low level models, then what is an explanation? I mean, in some sense, uh, it's not clear how you provide it. And so he said, what we need to do is to work with what she called interpretable machine learning, where, where the models are interpretable rather than, and there are, this is a research area. And I use the phrase explainable AI, but there are some good arguments why this is partly the, the various reasons have been mentioned here. This is not necessarily a good a good uh, term, and and again, that's why there's some argument people need that the, the current technology, dominant technology in, in, in machine learning, which is deep learning, the models are too low level, and that's why we need to figure out how to integrate uh, the low level reasoning with, with higher level reasoning that we can express in, in various high, le high level formalism. So you should take a look in inter inter interpretable machine learning. Yeah, maybe now uh, uh, let's keep for the moment this, this uh, important thing of explainable AI, of explainability. I would like to ask Brigitte first, maybe. So, I mean, so in this, in this standard, uh, PBS as in these forums, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, if 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 a, if a, a posting gets removed, no, then the users often, I can imagine, would like to know why. No? Mm, yeah. So is this something which is also on, on, on the on the agenda to have an, an explanation why why uh, uh, postings are removed in in. in practice? No, because the 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 first removal in the pre. Mm -hmm. moderation this is just gone uh, okay. and there's no explanation and people start complaining and they they start saying oh i'm censored and why i'm censored again and they already have so, so people start choking about the uh, censoring and say uh, i imagine when i write this then i get censored uh, maybe i write it this way uh, things like that and, and trying to kind of fool the system uh, this is yeah this is one thing and then there is this uh, inbuilt censorship of the people who can you you can alert as a as a co uh, poster or, or fellow reader in this forum you just can alert and say this is inappropriate or this is and and can also give uh, a reason why that's um, a part of how we got our data which uh, were positive as a positive data were looking at into these comments right mm -hmm. uh, and the explainability i think yes explainability would be really good for the for the users because you want to know why a person got removed uh, the explainability is uh, a sort of debugging for us um, sort of a high level debugging for us and it's it's also a sort of high level debugging for the moderators but uh, for the moderators it's much more important to get uh, the, the, the highest hits uh, that they are uh, in, in their sense, mm. so that they can work with the data, right? So uh, I think explain, explainability has a number of different angles to look at, depending on who uh, is talking about explainability or wishing for explainability. Martina, what about in the context of your research, would it be something reasonable to try to explain the users what will happen with the data if they click this and that? I think that's a yeah, general problem. Like that people should have more of an understanding how the technology runs their daily lives. And so one example is kind of not related, but uh, so we are trying to recruit more people for computer science and going into schools and figuring out how to get people to be, be interested. And what we're seeing is that, yes, we have this digital agenda in the schools, but not really any good solid curriculum. But it should be like basic knowledge of even yeah already at early stages in schools teaching about how machines work how software works what's behind all what's powering essentially all the services we're using so if you talk to someone on the street about machine learning it's like magic box and ai and nobody really has any idea what what's going on Okay, so for the final round now, I think we start in, in the audience, Carlo gets yeah, No, I, I, I have a question which is basically for Martina. Uh, you know, the, uh, the examples that she gave, you know, were kind of scary, you know, 
And uh, we are using apps, uh, you know, for everything, you know, on our phone. Now you can use your phone to, uh, you know, do whatever you do in your home and, and, and everybody do, does it, okay? So I'm wondering if, at least in Europe, you know, since there is this kind of sensibility towards, you know, privacy, uh, which, you know, came out you know, through a GPR as a very strong statement. Uh, but isn't this mature for use of verification technologies like the ones that you have been using to, uh, you know, identify those threats and those, you know, th those problems in those applications uh, be used for some kind of, you know, let's say, official certification that, you know, those things that we use every day are safe. Today, if you buy any electric appliance for your home, it has to be certified, right? Uh, so shouldn't this be the same, you know, for apps that, you know, people use every day, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that let's say uh, uh, Apple and, uh, uh, and Google, they put them at least in Europe on their, you know, market only if, they have been cleared, you know, through some kind of verification. Isn't this some strong statement that, you know, we should make, you know, for those? And, and so verification techniques are there for us um, to propose that they should be used, right? That's... I'm, I'm totally, fully, 100% <laughs> agree. Maybe let's also have a final question by, by Hannes Wertner from the audience and then make a Final round of statements with um, Martina, Brigitte, and Moshe. Just one um, a short question before this final question. Could you relate the term explainability to the term objective function Robin Burke used? Because I think we are talking about similar things. And he did not say how to explain, but he said, what, what is the objective of the system, which might be much easier than explaining and funding, a, let's say, a causal reasoning for something which was not causal at all. Uh, this might be something. Uh, my question to all of you, and maybe also to Edward, is I'm thinking of the guys who sit down tomorrow afternoon and write a roadmap, okay? Uh, and I would like to have your input to this roadmap in very concrete terms, so that when Erich and Paul and Linda are trying to write it down, they have, okay, from your specific area, what would be one or two challenges which have to be on a roadmap without $1 million, which <laughs> Helga wanted to have this morning. Okay. Okay, so let's have now this final round with, 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 so to say, with the panel extended by Ed Lee now. Uh, so I would, so, so we have, so to say, two concrete questions or, or remark comments on the table about, about the verification of the system, of the apps, then about the, uh, Explanation versus objective function. Maybe this is something Moshe wants to wants to say something. But of course, everyone is. And then we have this general. Uh, uh, and I think I think uh, Hannes, your 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 uh, idea to add Edward now to this final round uh, is that these were the four talks where we, which were really from a computer science perspective, with computer science like questions and challenges. So maybe let's. That's one, but in any case, I don't. Do, I could imagine what I'm <laughs> Yeah, let's let's put from, it that way. Yeah. From Edward, I know that we should think about the difference of man and machine, which is a very fundamental question, but which is hard to put on the road. Yes. Okay? Yes. We put the ten years plan, which is a little bit too far. Ed, could you understand Hannes now because he was not speaking to the mic mm -hmm. anymore? I I caught a few words, but uh, not all of it. No, they, they, my, it was a comment to Stefan that I put you on the table as well because from Paola's and also um, Robin's uh, presentation, I immediately got the feeling what would be issues we have to solve in a, in a, in a, in a roadmap. From yours, I have, uh, it's very fundamental observation and it's somehow the difference between man and machine, but what would be on a roadmap to go into this? direction okay from a concrete project proposal and things like that so this is the reason i was asking you thank you okay thanks so maybe let's start around with with martina um i'm starting with the verification question um so i know know personally how difficult this is to really certify an app and make sure you cover all the behavior 
but one thing I'm seeing in an ideal world, it would be nice to just start from scratch and design the systems in a way that you can verify the behavior and put your seal of approval on there. And I have the feeling that's connecting to the question before, it's just, Smartphones are around since like 2008 and they've just grown and newer features and just make it easy to develop and whatnot. There's little thought behind it, what the implications are. And it's just a mess. It's, <laughs> we should really start from scratch and, and think about how we can design those systems in a better way. But still, when you look at these labels that Apple has in the App Store, those say the app is accessing your photos but there's no connection to, and on the device there's permissions to access the photos. There should be some connection, but there isn't. And that's again, uh, not really a technical solution, but we should have some way to hold the companies more accountable for what the systems they're providing. Martina, Brigitte, your final concluding remarks. Um, I think the, uh, from my perspective, uh, how data is used and who has access to data is something which is very important. So on the one hand, from my example, there are reasons why we want to give data to the community so that people can uh, re uh, extend the data, relabel the data, uh, train new models with the data because the, the machine learning technology changes quite quickly. So this is the one type of data. Uh, and on the other hand, there are data. So there are all those companies, they just collecting data, partially without us knowing and just ignoring it because we, it's, re I really wonder, can you uh, just use uh, applications that are safe? Or do you use stuff which is kind of, according to your terms, not safe at all, and you, you shouldn't use it? So I, 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 I don't find, find a way out. So I think we need these two parts of the data and that, that would be something which should on, on this roadmap. So on the one hand, make data accessible, make it transparent that they are accessible and what is done with it. And on the other hand, uh, make sure that the companies not just take the data and do whatever they want. Okay. Thank you, Brigitte. So maybe not uh, it. Your final comments and the reply to Hannes. Yeah, I guess um, in some ways my my sense is that my message is more about what to keep off the roadmap rather than what to put on it. Um, and specifically, the thing that I think should be kept off the roadmap is all this discussion about AIs just as drop-in replacements for humans. And I think that we should recognize that that's probably not really the way it's going to play out that AIs are going to be working in conjunction with humans in almost any scenario that we imagine. They will be working, functioning as cognitive prosthesis for humans. So they could become, you know, kind of a part of our own cognitive uh, functioning rather than just, you know, external tools. Um, but, you know, even, I mean, in the, in the principles of embodied cognition, any tool that's used by a human becomes part of that human, right? It's, uh, you know, when you use a hammer, it's an extension of your arm and your brain adapts to being able to um, understand the motor dynamics of how the arm has changed by holding that hammer. And the same thing is going to be true when we're using AIs as, you know, in, in the context of any of our uh, societal functions. And so I guess, you know, the, the big message is that stop thinking of it as replacement and start thinking of it as, uh, as you know, the, the interaction and partnership that, that emerges uh, when the AIs are working together with the humans in a societal function. Okay, thank you very much. Moshe, your, your final remarks. So we have to go back to the very beginning. And humans wondered why humans seem to be working hard and other animals don't seem to be working so hard. So they came up with a story how we got expelled from the Garden of Eden and there was a curse and the curse is in the sweat of thy brow thou shall eat bread. So the answer is we never liked it. So the Aslan Revolution gave us a way to replace uh, hard work by machines. Okay. 
we liked it. We don't have to do hard work the same way that we used to do it. We can build now much bigger building because we have cranes. And then we came up with a way to process knowledge and we could compute things much faster than we had to do it by hand. And again, we liked it. It's just much easier. We don't like to work very hard. But somewhere down the line, this, this prosthesis that we have been developing for us went to something else that we don't like doing. We don't like making hard decisions. I mean, humans have to make sometimes very hard decisions. Think of, of people who, you know, in countries, we, in Texas, we have the death penalty. That means that, you know, juries have to vote for the death penalty. These are hard decisions. And you can, there are many other hard decisions humans have to make. And gradually using the same technology that and allow us to, to, to just do, you know, compute ballistic tables, we are now uh, having prostheses that are going to make decisions. And the decisions are not just which edge should I show Vardy when, when, he, when he clicks on the link, but also much more profound decisions. And the big question we should ask ourselves is, wait a minute, should machine make this kind of decision? And if they do, under what kind of what kind of guard guardrail do we want to establish? Explainability is just one aspect of it. But the first question should be: Should we allow machine to make these kind of decisions? They have to do profound implication for human life. And if we do, under what conditions? And right now, we're just the wild west. A company can come, and we have a technology, and they can sell it, and people are using it because there's there's no law. Technology is running way ahead of way ahead of the law. And the mantra is innovation, innovation. We have to pursue in innovation. Regulation stifles innovation. The answer is innovation. If innovation is, is bad, then by all means, let's stifle it. And so I think this, the, the big question is not just, you know, is do we want AI to do this? And what kind of AI do we need? And what are the other, what are the implications of having technology to do that? And, you know, the, you may remember the movie, what it was called, War Games. War Games was essentially kind of that movie about should we let AI deciding decide, decide to launch a nuclear war? And we don't have to go. I mean, this was taken to an extreme. There are many other cases we should ask ourselves, should we allow machines to do that? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Moshe. I think these are very well-suited and important concluding remarks for our first workshop day. Let me say a big thank you to all three speakers of, of this session and to the people who engaged in the discussion and to the audience who looks hungry and we now here go for, for, for dinner. And I send greetings to all virtual participants and hope to see you tomorrow again. Bye bye. You can tell them that we take a beer now. A beer? Yeah, a beer. A beer. <laughs> Hannes emphasized that there's also beer. Sorry to you. Sorry to the guys out there. Abend, Abend, gute Abend.